Next, we attend a speech at the City Club of Chicago by Diane Rauner, the president of the Ounce of Prevention Fund, as she explains the struggle to fight child poverty amidst state budget problems. This runs about 45 minutes. Thank you, Ed. And thank you to the City Club for having me here today. Uh, it's an honor to talk about an issue of great personal passion, but I think also tremendous importance to our state, an area of great strength and opportunity, early childhood development. You know, Illinois has built a tremendous early childhood education system, but uh, we're ahead, but w the rest of the country is catching up, and the world is changing here at home. So today, what I'd like to do is talk about three things. First, the impact of very significant demographic changes in Chicago and across Illinois. Secondly, why the early years are such an important opportunity for investing in human capital. And third, how urgent the need is to prioritize these investments even as resources become more scarce. So let me start with the demographic changes. First, uh, we can see that poverty in our state among the youngest children has actually increased since the recession. Again, these are the most vulnerable and the youngest children, um, and uh, we are not going in the right direction, guys. Also, quite interestingly, the place where poverty is happening has changed. So poverty in the city of Chicago since 2000 has increased by about 14%. In the suburbs, it's increased by 99%. There are now more poor people, twice as many poor people, in the suburbs of Chicago as in the city of Chicago. So th this is due to a lot of things. Clearly, we know about the transformation of the Chicago public housing system. But it's also the case that suburban mor mortgages were easier to get, um, actually um, housing costs are cheaper in the suburbs. The um, immigrant population has moved to the suburbs, and the suburbs were also really hard hit in the recession. Um, construction and other sectors really declined. So when we look statewide, what we see is, first of all, this is again 09 to 14, we see that overall increase in poverty, and we see the, um, it, the, trend, the, the movement of poverty to the suburbs and the persistence of poverty in the rural areas. I'd like to stop for a minute and talk about what this means in real terms, in terms of services to children and families. Services in a city are easier to access. In the suburbs, we have to think about transit. How do people get to services? How do people get to their supports? This is true in the, in the rural areas. The schools and um, other programs in the suburbs and in the rural areas are not likely to have the capacity to serve children in poverty. And these changes are happening very, very quickly. It's also really important to acknowledge, and we at The Ounce have been working in partnership with community-based agencies across the state for 35 years. It has always been the case that the capacity to run programs is not necessarily where the people are. There's far more capacity in the city of Chicago, far more human capital to support, pro to support the programs that serve people than there are in the rural counties and in the suburbs. And the challenge that we're facing right now is that as the demographic changes shift precipitously, we don't have the capacity in the suburbs and in the rural counties to handle it. Okay, that's poverty. Now let's look at diversity. English language learners, again, an enormous change across our country and across our state. In our state, the population of English language learners has gone up by 25% over the last decade. Now, interestingly, in fact, the population of English language learners in the city of Chicago has declined by 6%, whereas it's grown by 52% across the rest of the state. So again, think about what that means in terms of service and capacity. School districts across the suburbs and in the rural counties are scrambling to find certified English language learning teachers who can serve these populations. And this is um, interestingly, particularly, of course, the youngest, the, the young, youngest children are the leading edge of demographic change. We have over 200,000 Spanish-speaking children under the age of five 
in our state. Not to mention tens of thousands who are speaking Arabic, Chinese, Urdu, Polish, Hindi. And we do not have the capacity to do what we know is developmentally appropriate to serve these children in, the, in our education system. This trend is statewide, it's happening rapidly. And we know that building that capacity is particularly challenging outside of Chicago. So we have more impoverished children, we have more diverse needs. We also have an increase in children with developmental delays. Now there's a couple of reasons for this. The first is a really good reason. We've gotten a whole lot better at saving premature babies. That's wonderful. But they're coming into the school system with a greater likelihood for developmental delays. We've also seen a steep rise in the number of children who are identified with autism spectrum disorder. And that identification is happening earlier, which is a good thing. Early intervention is a really, really good thing. It's just that it costs a lot of money and it takes a lot of capacity. And then finally, we know that children exposed to poverty, to homelessness, um, to um, in child welfare or in other at-risk circumstances are more likely to experience developmental delays. We have a budding and terrifying crisis that's beginning in our rural counties of babies born to opioid addicted mothers. Nobody knows what those children are going to need. Now national data on disability preference right now would suggest that about 13 percent of children birth to three are experiencing developmental delays and would benefit from early intervention services. We in our state are serving about 4% of them. So many children are remaining unidentified and many children are identified but there is no service available for them. Again, because the human capacity, the speech language therapists, the occupational therapists, the people that do this work are not evenly distributed where the kids are. And then finally, um, our, our most um, disadvantaged in this, in this um, state and across the country have not recovered from the Great Recession. We know that unemployment among low-income workers is 27 percent in our state. One and a half million people in Illinois are food insecure. Over half a million children in Illinois are food insecure. Just let that sink in in our country, in this rich country, half a million children in Illinois are food insecure, and 50,000 children in our state are homeless. So we have a different pro poverty problem than we had a decade ago, but the problem is bigger and more pressing than ever. And here's the worst part, and the dumbest part from a developmental perspective. The younger you are in this country, the more likely you are to be poor. Even among children, children birth to five, the youngest children are more likely to be poor. That makes sense because their parents are younger less, and less um, uh, well off. But it's also the case that children under the age of three are more than twice as likely to be poor as people over the age of 65. That is a political decision, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But here's why it's so stupid, because the brain is growing most rapidly at the time when children are most likely to be poor. This is just basic, dumb human capital investment. So as you can see from this slide, the bulk of brain development begins in, it happens in the first five years of life, and in fact, in the first three years of life. This is when the brain is growing so rapidly and when it is most sensitive, of course, to environmental inputs. And this is when children are more likely, likely to be poor. So let me take just a little bit more time to talk about what's going on in the brain and why it's so important that we think about these first early years and the impact that high quality environments or for that matter poverty can have in these first early years. We know that the, that the brain, that human beings are born with absolutely the most um, undeveloped brains of any species and that's partially because we have to develop such complicated brains and partially because we have to walk upright and there's a limit to how big our heads can be when we're born. But because of this, babies are growing their brains at a phenomenal rate in the first few years of life. The number of neurons, brain cells that are growing is enormous, but what's even more enormous are the connections between brain cells, what's called synapses. Babies are building a million synapses a second. 
Inco it's just inconceivable how many synapses are being connected. And those synapses are essentially like the pathways between brains, that's how we, between neurons. That's how we send signals and get things done. And what happens over time is babies produce this huge amount of neurons, and by three years, that's when you have actually the densest brain in terms of neural synaptic connections. But then you start pruning. And what that means is that the activities and the experiences that you have repeatedly create thick synaptic highways, and the things that you don't do or you don't use just wither away. This is why, as adults, we can drive almost without thinking, which is, all right, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> not all of us, <laughs> some of us, um, sorry about that. Um, but we can, we can learn, we can, we, can, we can read quickly, we can, but it's very hard for us to learn new languages. So in fact, the brain becomes more specialized, more focused, and more efficient as we get older. But the opportunities for growth, this is when we talk about brain plasticity, about the early childhood brain being plastic, this is what it means. So here's the challenge. Because in fact, babies are born with this opportunity and born with, the, with what we call an experience expectant brain. So they are actually expecting interactions. That's how the brain figures out everything from the laws of physics to how the world works to who they are. So babies are looking to the interactions that they're having with the natural world and most explicitly and most specifically with, other, with adults to understand how to make sense of their world, and in fact, to put their brain together. Brain architecture happens in the context of interactions, millions and millions of interactions with the everyday world. This is a great opportunity. It's a tremendous opportunity to do all sorts of things. You can teach babies multiple languages in the first, first few years of life. You can teach babies, we do teach babies, all sorts of things about how the world works and who they are and, and, and what is expected of them. They actually also learn how to actually develop their own sense of self-regulation. Babies are born literally with the ability to cry, and that's about it. They can't walk, they can't self-locomote, can't protect themselves in any way. But by crying, they get interactions, and those interactions begin to teach them how to use their, their own brain to calm themselves down and self-regulate. So that's the serve and return that babies are expecting every moment of their day. And when it comes well, it's a beautiful thing. And most of us here in the room, if we've held a baby and we've looked in their eyes, we know exactly what that means and what that feels like. But there are babies who are not getting that on a regular basis. And they're not getting it not because their parents don't love them, but because their parents are probably working two or three jobs. And maybe because their parents are stressed, depressed, and subject to community violence, domestic violence, maybe they're, they have substance abuse. We have children who, by no fault of their own, are essentially being deprived of, a, of, the, tr of the essential interactions that they have to have. And so the children who are born with, um, with in, into the lucky uh, the lucky gene pool, are building brains that are able to self-regulate, able to uh, manage the future, and, and building an understanding of the world as a place that is safe, predictable, and over which they have agency. Children who aren't in those circumstances, not so much. So we're going to do a little, this is time for a little interactive learning experience, so everyone needs to raise their right hand. Take your thumb, put it across your palm. That is the amygdala. That is the, the center of the brain. It's the part of the brain that is responsible for emotions. It's where your fight and flight um, uh, um, impulses come from. It's where all the cortisol and all the other adrenaline hormones come out of the amygdala. Now take your other four fingers and put them over your thumb. That's the prefrontal cortex. That's the part of the brain that does learning, memory, impulse control, higher order thinking. So what do you notice? It's all connected, right? The amygdala is touching the prefrontal cortex. You don't get to just turn the amygdala off and use your prefrontal cortex. Um, one of my favorite researchers always says, emotion drives attention and attention drives learning. So think about this in the context 
of a baby who doesn't have an efficient stress response system. The baby who maybe hasn't been picked up every time he's cried, or maybe when he's picked up, he's yelled at or shaken um, and get, becomes more dysregulated, more frightened. That's a baby whose neural pathways are not turning into superhighways that settle him right back down, push the cortisol back into where it goes and, and turn back into a calm resting state that can focus on the next task at hand. That's a baby or a kindergartner or a teenager for whom dysregulation, fear, high alert is always present. That's a child for whom the tiger is always in the room. And when we think about schooling, when we think about violence prevention, when we think about all of the enormous tasks of learning that we expect of our young people so that they can become productive citizens, you cannot learn those things if you are worried about your fundamental survival, if you're always on high alert. This is the challenge and this is unfortunately the natural experiment that we have been in for some time. And unfortunately, it's something we can see in the brain with new imaging techniques. We can actually see physical differences in the brain architecture of children who have been raised in traumatic situations from those who have been raised in what we would describe as optimal situations. What we have here is pictures of four-year-old brains. And the circles are around, again, that prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain that I was talking about, higher order thinking, memory, um, everything you need in school. The proliferation of stress hormones, the cortisol and adrenaline that comes out of the amygdala when, 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 any, when all of us um, are, are dysregulated, um, if that's a constant presence in the brain, it actually suppresses the growth of gray matter in the prefrontal cortex. To the extent that it can be seen on, um, on, on uh, scans of the brain, and it can be measured in terms of functional ability. There's some really terrifying research that's come out of Berkeley on middle school and high schoolers who were poor in their first five years of life compared to middle schoolers and high schoolers who were not poor in their first five years of life. And they're given batteries of tests on, you know, memory, um, word association, lots of things having to do with speed of processing. What the researchers have found is a difference between the children who were poor and the children who weren't that's on the order of having had a stroke. So let's just process that for a minute. Here we are focusing on um, the outcomes of kids in um, high, on, on ISATs and on um, high, high school graduation, and we have structural, actually brain architecture differences that are not going to go away. You can't go back to the critical period and rebuild. It just doesn't happen. And that's why when we look overall at trends in um, development, what we see is that the achievement gap is wide open at age three, and it's pretty persistent through age 18. Now this is um, um, uh, math. These are achievement scores by maternal education. You can look at the same thing looking at by income quartile. The point is the achievement gap is open by age three. You can measure it at nine months. If you know what you're looking for, you can see it at three months. And it doesn't really move. This doesn't mean that formal schooling isn't important. It just means that our investments in those time are not going to close the achievement gap. So this combination of persistent poverty and increasing need, along with the corresponding sensitivity of the developing brain, is a huge social, moral, and economic challenge for us. We can't continue to pretend that formal schooling is going to close the achievement gap. We can continue to focus on improving K-12 schools, but if we're not thinking about the children and their capacities when they come in, we're always fighting a losing battle. Now, fortunately, there is actually a wide body of research that demonstrates that early interventions do work. Um, this is a list of the um, profound life impacts 
of um, early childhood interventions, and it's a, a it's an assortment of um, randomized control research that's been done over decades to um, demonstrate the power of investing early and the imp impact of early investments. Many of you have probably seen this slide. If you've ever hung around the ounce, we spent a lot of time with this slide. This is a this is actually research that our um, friend Jim Heckman, Nobel Laureate in Economics from the University of Chicago, has done. And actually, uh, Jim came to this work, he's a labor economist, he came to this work because he was asked to unwind the job training programs from the Clinton administrations in the 90s that actually had negative uh, returns on investment, as in the programs cost more than people ever learned from them. And just out of idle curiosity or intellectual curiosity, Jim went back and thought, well, where do investments in the life cycle actually have, in human capital, when do they have the greatest impact? And he went back, all the way back to early childhood. Now, Jim doesn't want to talk about anything after the age of two and parents. That's all he's interested in. And the reason for that is quite clear. It's because, in fact, just as we saw in the brain architecture, it's always great when you know economic research aligns with brain research and scientific research. What we know is that, in fact, all of these things are, have compounding effects. Um, you know, all you finance folks love to talk about compounding, right? So um, this, that's essentially what Jim had found, is that skill begets skill. We can see it in the brain architecture. A strong brain builds a brain that can do more, and children actually are compounding the benefits by their own actions. That's why it's so profound to invest in the first couple of years of life, because there's so much opportunity to build on that across the life cycle. And it's interesting, some of this research that's very interesting, and, and I, I think just going back here, you'll see some of these, well, maybe not, yep. You'll see some of these impacts actually are impacts over long periods of life. So one of the things that Jim did is went back to an intervention from the 70s called the Abbasidarian Project, which is a lot like our Educare Project. In fact, I should say our Educare Project is a lot like Abbasidarian because we learned a lot from that. But um, what he went back to find is it's not a health, it was not a health intervention, it was an early childhood education intervention. But he looked at the, at the um, recipients of that when they were in their 40s and 50s and found tremendous differences in their health outcomes, obesity, diabetes, um, substance abuse, um, healthy lifestyles, and found that the subjects who had received the intervention were far healthier than the control group. This wasn't because there was anything that was done at that time so much as they actually built more capable, stronger um, lives out of, out of the experience that they had at the beginning. So other research has found that with high quality early childhood experiences, uh, people are more likely to have higher incomes, to own a home, to, to stay out of the criminal justice system, to avoid teen pregnancy, uh, to go on welfare, to need special education. It's a pretty long litany of um, positive outcomes. So this is a really important time. I hope you would agree. And um, here's how we fund it. <laughs> It's a total mess. Um, you know, this is, uh, this is the challenge, you know, if you go back to that interactive learning experience, we don't have separate parts of our body for the family, the health, the brain, um, and yet we have a lot of different funding streams. And for families and for programs, this is how they experience it. Lots of funding streams coming from lots of different directions. The other thing I really, you know, this, w this took us a long time to build this, but um, we're very proud of it. Um, because it also, <laughs> it also um, shows us, in, it's color coded. You can see the red is federal funds, blue is state funds, and the purple are blended funds. So I want to um, take a minute for you all to absorb how much of this is federal funds. Um, what's not on here right now is uh, Medicaid. But it's really important to acknowledge that a third of the um, of, uh, children in our country are on Medicaid and that Medicaid serves pregnant women and babies. And those are really, really important investments. And so we're all very concerned about what's going to happen there. Now, the other challenge here is that no one funding stream serves all of what a family needs. So everybody in our state is blending and braiding funding streams and working with different agencies and different services. There's just a huge amount of work that goes in to putting all of this together. Let me take a minute to talk briefly about these funding streams. So first and foremost, 
well, maybe not. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. We have um, the early childhood block grant. This is a state. Um, this is a state education um, funding stream. As you can see, it's about almost about five hundred million dollars. It's at its highest level ever. Then we have um, home visiting funds and um, early intervention funds. These are also state funds. Um, then we add to that a big enchilada, um, and that is childcare. And childcare is a blend of state and federal funds. Again, we're at our highest levels ever in this. Um, then we have Head Start, which is a federal program, federal to local. And then way up on the top, we have actually seen a significant amount of increase in um, federal funds for early education in the last, um, so it, during the Obama administration. And those are coming to an end, and that will have some significant impact to us as well. What I'm trying to show you here is this is a pretty complicated system. It's a system that depends both on the health of our state and on federal funds. And um, if you put this in the context of the opportunity and the need, it's not nearly enough. So this, I think, is really important for us to think about. Our demographic trends are pushing against all of this. We also know that we're not serving all the children who need the services and that we have much more that we could and should be doing. Now, I want to just put this in the context of our nation because I want us all to feel not terrible about what we're doing in Illinois. We're doing good work in Illinois, but we as a country are making some really dumb choices. And we're, we're, we're actually le being left behind by the rest of the developed world. So this is a slide that shows the investment in early care and education f um, for the United States at 0.4% of GDP versus everybody else. We're down there with Latvia and Turkey. Uh, so that's, uh, that's too bad. And then this is a slide that shows child poverty and overall poverty, again, um, compared to our, um, to many of our neighbors. Again, we're down there in some not great company. Um, but what's really interesting, and the thing that really disturbs me about this is, so the blue bar is child poverty, and the diamond is overall poverty. So here's what makes me sad and sick. Again, our child poverty rate is higher than our overall poverty rate. How awful is that? How stupid is that? Um, and again, we're, we're in not great company in that, in that as well. So um, again, this is a political challenge. When, um, when we want to, we can change the poverty rate. Many of you know we cut the poverty rate of seniors by two thirds um, over 30 years. But in the um, time from 1969 to 2014, the child poverty rate has actually increased by one third. We're making political decisions. Um, and just, we should just acknowledge that. Fortunately, there's actually political will. So we have um, had a um, federal advocacy and communications effort based in Washington for the last 10 years. And, um, over the last four years, we've been doing polls, asking people whether they're actually, wh how, wh what they think we should be doing, our country should be doing in terms of investment in early education. We're proud to say that this is an issue that transcends political party. It actually transcends all kinds of demographics. There is really strong support for investment in early education. So we just have to get it done. Um, and it's not just about money. And this is one of the things I do want to talk about. Here in Illinois, we have done a great job of building an early childhood system. And it's, it's been due to the work of many in this room and many of the foundations that have supported early childhood education for a very long time. We've had a shared set of principles, not just about serving um, the most at risk, but about serving the most at risk with evidence-based, high-quality programs and supporting all of the infrastructure, professional development, research, data systems that support high-quality investments. And that has been, again, an ongoing public-private effort. We're proud to say that early childhood education has, been, has received great bipartisan support here in Illinois for decades. 
and that's very, very important, and it's why we have as, as good a system as we do. But there's so much more to do. So at the ounce, we are, as, um, as Ed mentioned, a public-private partnership. We are solely focused on children in poverty from before birth through age five. But we work in all of these spheres because we know that it actually takes program development, it takes professional development, it takes advocacy and policy, it takes ongoing research and continuous quality improvement, and all of the work to pull this system together and to make this a high quality system. But babies can't wait. Every day, a million synapses, every, every second. Every day, there are, every fall, we have um, children going into kindergarten who aren't ready to succeed. And we owe it to them to make sure, and to us and to our future, to make sure that we allow them to succeed. So thanks very much. I'll stop here. Uh, this is from Karen Retan, City Club member, uh, with the Public Health Institute of Metropolitan Chicago. What do you think the long-term, next five years, impact of the budget impasse will be on social services in Illinois? Well, obviously, social services in Illinois have been um, under tremendous pressure over the last couple of years. And, um, but I would also say social service programs have been under tremendous pressure for at least a decade. Um, I, I know that um, we've been at the ounce uh, through a few cycles of late payments over the last decade. And uh, we are all, I think, hopeful for a long-term solution that provides um, the proper funding for the social service programs that need it. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is from Robin Steens with the Steens Family Foundation. <clears throat> Has any state managed to streamline funding to more effectively support early childhood programs? Robin, you said you were going to give me easy questions. <laughs> That's, That's Robin, not... you know, you can always count on her. <laughs> That's not fair. Yes. I would say that um, there are states that have um, tried to integrate uh, their funding um, streams and to integrate to create offices of early childhood development that bring more of those funding streams together. Now, um, some of the programs, like Head Start, are, gonna, are federal to local, and there's no getting around that. Um, we have, I think, over the last few years, um, with the creation of the Office of Early, Governor's Office of Early Childhood Development, tried to in, ensure greater collaboration, but there's a lot more to do to, in, to ensure that the agencies are working together. And the hard work happens at the state level instead of at the local level. So there's a lot more we can do, and, and there are um, states like Connecticut and Pennsylvania that have um, experimented with mob models, and, and we at the Early Learning Council, I should make you answer this, Phyllis. <laughs> Um, I, uh, ha are, are we're looking at, at other opportunities for how we can how we can do that. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Remember that was Robin Steen, S T E A N. Okay. This is from uh, Lee Rubenstein with the Civic Leadership Foundation. Metrics for organizations dealing within the realm of socio emotional issues are difficult. Any suggestions on how to address this? when facing funders. Yeah, no, I think that's really true. You know, it's, we always, um, we value what we can measure and it's much easier to measure uh, vocabulary or achievement test scores than it is to measure um, social emotional development. There are actually newer ways of measuring that um, and we, are, we have tried some of those. There are also good proxies, you know, um, attendance is a pretty good measure of how parents and children are doing. Um, so there are behavioral measures that matter a lot, but it's an area actually that needs, that continues to need, need research without question. Okay, the question is from Joe Gomez, right down here, who writes left-handed by the way. How is the use of telephone cell phone games affecting children's development? Ooh, ooh, okay. How much time do we have? All right, so this is actually a really important issue, and it's important for two reasons. First, because, you know, there was this idea that somehow baby Mozart was going to be a great way to raise kids, and it turns out that it has absolutely no effect 
So if you were at our annual luncheon, shameless plug for our annual luncheon, um, you would have heard from a renowned a neuro, uh, brain um, scientist, uh, Pat Cool, who has done research on how children learn language or even the sounds of languages. Turns out kids don't learn anything unless there's eye contact involved. So a child in front of um, a television or a computer screen um, will not absorb anything um, even if it's exactly the same material that is presented by a live human being or for you grandparents out there, if you're on Skype with your grandchild, it still works. But it's absolutely, absolutely true. Now why is this? Because in fact, this is, brains are very, very sophisticated. These, brain, these babies have, that are building these brains are huge, they're, they're basically statistical processors. They're getting all of these inputs and they're just doing what a super, supercomputer does and thinking about What's the most um, frequent thing that's happening? Well, that must be the, th the thing that I'm focusing on. So it's their frequency modulators. But they only turn the computer on when they have eye contact. So social interaction is a gateway for brain development. Without that, nothing's happening. They're not paying attention. That's number one. The other qu part of your question, though, which is the really saddest part, and this is also something you can see on some pretty scary films, is what happens when adults disassociate. And um, I'm very pleased that not many of you are on your cell phone right now, but all of us have a really bad habit of looking at that thing and kind of going away from wherever we are in the present. And it's kind of fine when you're sitting next to your spouse who's old enough to tell you to stop. <laughs> but if you go into McDonald's or I'm not picking on McDonald's. Go into a, anywhere where you see parents with very, very young children, and sometimes pre-verbal children, and you see the parent on her cell phone, and that child is going to make a bid for attention. And sometimes the bid for attention will be something that the parent doesn't want. So that level of attunement that is missing because Mom's gone, gone away, and child is trying to get her back. Leads to some pretty unpleasant interactions because children act out when they want attention. And so when we think about, you know, we're all guilty of this, um, and I don't know about you, but my kids sometimes say, get off your cell phone. It's easy to do when you're 20, harder to do when you're two. Um, that's probably more than you want to hear, but it's, it's a serious problem. And we think about that because we know, again, everything I just said about social interaction, and then you have this device that literally sucks social interaction out of the way for adults. And adults are the ones that have to do this with kids. So. Well, Joe, that's a lot of food for thought there. So don't give your three-year-old that cell phone. Make him wait a few years. OK. Um, Diane, one of the points that you made was the um, tremendous number of people involved and the need for um, early intervention and programs at the zero to five level. Yet it seems that a lot of the people who work in that area are so low on the pay scale and the preparation. Any thoughts about how we yeah. could change some of that? Well, that is, the workforce is a huge challenge, and it is a challenge because it is an under undercapitalized workforce, undereducated, underpaid. And um, again, when I went back to those funding streams, they're all paying for just, just kind of enough. But we have to actually increase the funding on that, and the availability of, of funds to support high-quality early learning. In our state, we have, over many years, and with a lot of advocacy, raised the credentials required of um, teachers who work in um, state-funded preschool programs, whether they're in the schools or in the um, or in community-based programs, and that has also led to an increase in pay. In um, in the home visiting space, we have um, we've actually used our federal dollars to try to raise to set a floor for the payment of home visitors for the for the salary a salary floor. Now all of these are small incremental efforts. They're not nearly enough. But this is the way we have to do this. We have to continue to push up the, um, the, the pay grade because 
we need to bring better people, more people, and, 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 and people who will, can stay in the field and get better at what they do for these kids. Thank you, thank you. Um, we just have a couple more questions here. Uh, this is from Neil Nosen, entrepreneur. I love that. Um, would you please explain why, in your opinion, infant mortality is so high in the United States? Okay, I'll do my best because this is not actually an area of expertise for me, but I do care quite a bit about it and I know a little bit. So the problem with infant mortality in our state, in our country, is a lot like um, some of the other problems that we just showed, that we just looked at. There's huge, huge disparities in um, infant mortality. So um, we have um, infant mortality differences by race and geography and income that are extraordinary. Um, and we have capacity problems with respect to that. Um, here in our state, uh, there's a tremendous lack of supports for high-risk pregnancies south of, um, in the southern half of our state, and that's a big challenge. Again, going back to the question of um, capacity and where are the people and with the need versus where is the infrastructure, that's a big challenge. Um, but um, infant mortality is a tremendous challenge, again, that's related to poverty and related to the disparities that we have in, um, in services for, for, for children and families. Thank you, Diana. This is from Kathy Carmody, the Institute on Public Policy for People with Disabilities. Thank you for the presentation. I know we all share that. Can you comment on how social service organizations across Illinois can work collaboratively rather than competitively to support populations in need? Well, I think one of the things we're very um, hopeful for is that the more community level collaboration we can get, the better. The more we can think about um, communities, uh, in a sense, not competing for clients, but rather having coordinated intake and coordinated uh, referral systems, uh, the better. And that's a big focus of some of the work that we've been trying to do in piloting across the country, across the state. Great, final question. From Dr. Sonia Boone with the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern University. Where are you, Dr. Boone? Great. Could you discuss how the mental health of mothers are addressed and what programs are being accelerated to improve health and mental health in a short period of time? <laughs> well, that's a really important question, and it's mental health of mothers and also mental health of teachers and the caregivers who are working with kids. Um, we know that, um, that Many, I think uh, some of the research suggests that as many as 50% of mothers um, in, um, who qualify for Head Start are depressed. And a depressed mother is obviously a risk factor for all sorts of developmental issues because of the response, need for responsiveness. So it's a really important issue. And it's one of the things that um, we know that home visiting programs and other programs that work directly with families can provide is support for mental health needs and referral but again, we tend not to have the capacity to serve all those that need it, and so we have to do more to provide those supports and those services. Um, one of the things that we're most proud of in our state is we are a leader in early childhood mental health services, and we have, thanks to the leadership of the Irving Harris Found Foundation, we have um, in our state really piloted and developed the use of early childhood mental health consultants in. Um, in early childhood programs that can work with teachers and with families to help um, to help children who are usually little canaries in the coal mine in terms of their behavior um, uh, support their development and their behavior behavioral health. Thank, let's everybody let's give Diana Rauner a big round of applause. Thank you so much. Don't leave. Don't leave.